Just two centuries ago in Europe, the idea of four and five-year-olds going to school with a system of learning would have been preposterous. Of course, during the Middle Ages, if you were the son of a nobleman, you might get an education from a private tutor. But the children of common folk, they went to work just as soon as they were able, just to help the family survive. But by the 19th century in Germany, industrialization and urbanization were nurturing an era of progress and learning, gave rise to great musicians like Schubert and Wagner and Beethoven and writers like uh, Johann Wolfgang van Gogh of the Brothers Grimm and the establishment of the University of Berlin. And industrialization was giving rise to a growing working class whose children needed care outside the home. Today, kindergartners are those cute four- and five-year-olds that are headed off to school with their glue sticks and their rounded scissors and an excitement to learn. But the entire concept of kindergarten is relatively new, and it came from one of the most important educational reformers of the 19th century. It is history that deserves to be remembered. While evidence from existing hunter-gatherer societies suggests there was no system of formal education prior to the development of agriculture and settlement, the idea of public education is ancient. Versions of formal structures of education and schooling are recorded among, for example, the ancient Chinese, Egyptians, Greeks, Indians, Persians, and Romans. Schooling was often segregated between the wealthy and the poor, and often limited to boys and citizens, and in some cases was specifically outlawed for girls and slaves. Education of boys was often designed around military service. In ancient Persia, for example, education was mostly done by retired soldiers. In the medieval period, education became even more segregated in Europe. Nobility would receive various forms of schooling through tutors, and the Catholic Church provided education via both monasteries and cathedrals, although the education was largely limited to young men seeking to join the clergy. While there were systems of education like apprenticeships and slow universities and centers of learning developed, for the most part there was no system of education for children of the masses. Children were expected to work from a young age, and education, such as it existed, centered around obedience to authority. There was a significant shift driven by the Protestant Reformation. In the Protestant philosophy, salvation depended upon reading the scriptures. This drove the need for public schooling enough to achieve literacy. During the 17th century, laws developed in many places requiring schooling for children, including in the American colonies, where in 1647 the General Court of the Massachusetts Bay Colony decreed that every town of 50 families should have an elementary school, and that every town of 100 families should have a Latin school. Into this world was born the man who would coin the term kindergarten. Frederick Froebel was born in 1782 in the town of Oberwiesbach in what is now western Germany. His mother passed away when he was nine months old, and his father was an Orthodox Lutheran pastor who had little time for his children. This led to Froebel spending much of his time playing outdoors in the family garden. Because of his father, faith was central in his life, but he loved nature so much, in fact, that Froebel became an apprentice to a forester at the age of 15. Two years later, he decided to study mathematics and botany in Jena, a German center of education and research known for Friedrich Schiller University, which was founded centuries before in 1558. As industrialization developed, the need for child workers declined, and the concept of school as the child's work began. Childhood pedagogy at the time relied on religious concepts of original sin and discipline, and the object was to create good citizens, or in America, good Puritans. Willfulness and free thinking were the enemy of school teachers who were trying to indoctrinate their students with punctuality, the ability to follow direction and tolerance for tedious work. Froebel, however, accepted a position as a secondary school teacher at the new model school in Frankfurt. The head of the school was a student and friend of Swiss pedagogue Johann Pestalozzi. Pestalozzi's new theory on education and teaching was revolutionary. His motto was, learning by head, hand, and heart, and his approach was child-centered and relied on the natural abilities of the children, not discipline and lectures. Pestalozzi believed that children were active learners, and he leaned heavily on the fact that human nature is essentially good. He posited that observation of every aspect of a child's life is necessary to help form the whole person. Albert Einstein was taught at a school using Pestalozzi's method, about which Einstein said, It made me clearly realize how much superior an education based on free action and personal responsibility is to one relying on outward authority. Pestalozzi's approach deeply affected Froebel's own theories and his desire to teach children. During the Napoleonic Wars, Froebel served in the Lutzow Free Corps, a volunteer corps fighting for Prussia against Napoleon that was known for including many educators and academics, fighting in the final defeat of Napoleon in the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. In 1816, Froebel was able to open his own school, the Universal German Educational Institute, in the area of Germany called Thuringia. 
His school was not for the youngest of children, but allowed him to expand his theories regarding learning. Two friends that he met during his military service and their wives created a new educational community that ultimately thrived. Froebel shared the methods and principles he created in several treatises, and he wrote his greatest work, Menschen Etziung, or The Education of Man, in 1826. In 1831, he accepted an invitation from the Swiss government to train elementary school teachers, and from 1835 to 1836, he led an orphanage. But in 1837, he returned to Germany and dedicated himself to education for preschool children. He established the Play and Activity Institute, an early childhood school for three- and four-year-olds, and in 1840 coined the word Kindergarten, or Garden of Children, as the new name for the Institute. This was a creative play on words, utilizing both Froebel's love of nature and his belief that children should be nurtured and left to grow with their own innate abilities, like plants in a garden. This allowed them to develop, he theorized, to their full potential according to the laws of nature. Froebel's philosophy was designed around creative play. Children played with specific toys that he designed that he called Froebel's gifts and activities that he called occupations. Students did singing and dancing for physical activity and they observed and cared for an actual physical garden. Those gardens were learning tools. They taught lessons in the real world application of math and taught children to seek understanding and inquisitiveness out in the natural world. They demonstrated the fundamentals of hard work and reward and of course they provided nutritious food. Froebel believed that play is the mirror of life, and because the child learns easily through play, it must not be left to chance, but has to be an integral part of the curriculum. And so he created toys and occupations that were to be introduced one at a time. The toys were sets of cubes, cylinders, and spheres that, by encouraging free play, allowed the introduction of various concepts, starting with color in the first gift, which is a set of six differently colored felt balls. The second is a set of wooden shapes, and the third is eight small cubes that together form a larger cube, and so each gift becomes more complex and introduces a new developmentally appropriate concept. Froebel's occupations included things we would consider today to be standard preschool activities, things like drawing, painting, and manipulating clay, but also included cooking, sewing, and woodwork, and weaving. Through these activities, the child was able to practice and achieve a sense of power or accomplishment. Furthermore, these activities were not meant to mold or drill information into young children, but simply to encourage them in their own learning through play, individually, and in groups. All of Froebel's concepts promoted independence and social responsibility, learning qualities that were considered basic to citizenship. Proponents of his method addressed a petition to the Frankfurt Assembly asking that kindergarten be used in a new national system of education. During this time, 31 kindergartens were formed in parts of Germany and were open to all social classes and religions. Froebel's teachings encouraged a nurturing and supportive classroom, allowing for the child's innate ability towards rationality and spiritual growth. Thus, Froebel included mothers as central to the education of small children for their natural ability to provide this nurturing environment, a concept that challenged the male-dominated field of education. Arguing that teaching was a specialized field that needed proper training, Froebel started the first institute to train female kindergarten teachers. This influenced a radical experiment in women's education when three women formed an academy in Hamburg in 1849. The philosophical basis of their institution used a proposal created by Karl Froebel, nephew of the kindergarten founder. Karl and his wife Joanna Froebel wanted women to have professional opportunities as teachers and promoted social transformation through the use of women's maternal gifts. The school's training in kindergarten was headed by none other than Friedrich Froebel. The experiment, however, created a backlash in conservative Prussia as kindergarten came to be associated with radical feminist ideas. As a response, the Prussian regime banned Froebel's kindergartens in 1851 and condemned the entire concept of kindergarten as being socialist and atheist. But the ban didn't kill the movement. Rather, the newly trained kindergarten teachers took the idea to other nations, including England, France, Belgium, and Italy, and eventually back to Germany when the ban was lifted in 1854. One of Froebel's students, Marguerite Schertz, started the first German-speaking kindergarten in the United States in Watertown, Wisconsin in the year 1856. This led to Elizabeth Peabody forming the first English-speaking kindergarten in Boston in 1870. Peabody wrote in a statement to Congress in 1897, the advantage to the community in utilizing the age from four to six in training the hand and eye, in developing the habits of cleanliness, politeness, self-control, urbanity, industry, in training the mind to understand numbers and geometric forms, to invent combinations of figures and shapes, and to represent them with a pencil, 
These and other valuable lessons will, I think, ultimately prevail in securing to us the establishment of this beneficial institution in all the city school systems of our country. The U.S.'s first successful public kindergarten program began in St. Louis. Susan Blow, a wealthy socialite, convinced the superintendent of public schools to incorporate kindergarten in 1873. His main concern at the time was the dropout rate of young children, and Blow believed that starting earlier would help prevent this. Blow's first class had 42 students. Three years later, she led 50 teachers and over 1,000 students, and by 1883, all St. Louis public schools had a kindergarten. In 1876, the United States Centennial Commission recognized St. Louis and Blow for excellence of kindergarten in public schools. Froebel, however, did not live to see his dream realized, dying before the ban on kindergarten was lifted in his home country. Although the state of Prussia acknowledged the value of kindergarten by creating a qualifying exam for kindergarten teachers in 1911, school systems in Germany do not formally incorporate kindergarten classes. The majority of three to six-year-old children in Germany do attend a kindergarten program, but it's not considered necessary, and it's not always free. There's concern by some modern educators that kindergarten in the United States has lost track of Froebel's philosophy. While kindergarten is universally integrated into public school systems in the United States, the prevailing philosophy is that the student is supposed to be able to read by the end of that first year of instruction. But when kindergarten was created, one of the fundamental concepts was that it was a fun and playful way to introduce students to concepts of learning, and it was devoid of things like testing and drilling on the alphabet. In 1873, author W.N. Haleman said, To Froebel belongs the credit for finding the true nature of play and regulating it to lead naturally into work. The same spontaneity and joy, the same freedom and serenity that characterize the plays of childhood are realized in all human activity. The gifts and occupations are the living connection which makes both play and work expressions of the same creative activity. National Kindergarten Day is celebrated in the United States on April 21st, Froebel's birthday. And despite being a relatively new development, kindergarten, that transition from home to school, has become a nearly ubiquitous rite of passage around the world. According to the website Statistia, in 2015, there were 3.64 million children enrolled in public kindergartens in the United States, and another 426,000 enrolled in private ones. It is, for many, the place where the love of learning begins. After all, I went to kindergarten, and I grew up to be... The History Guy. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe. <laughs>